Uh, yeah, Coach, uh, just uh, I actually did some homework here. Uh, just Hopkins, the, the punter, the kicker. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what are his strengths? And, uh, you know, I guess J.K. Scott, the punter from Alabama, uh, what's his? Uh, well, J.K. Scott, I'll start with him. J.K. Scott, right footed punter. Now, this, he's, he has a unique deal because he gets great hang time on his punts. I'm talking, we're timing five fives, five fours, and there's not a lot of opportunities for returns. And when people do take chances, they get the bare minimum on the returns. I believe that the Chargers have the number one punt coverage team when it comes to yards per return. So it's going to be a great challenge. He does get the ball outside the numbers, but that's the unique thing about him. He's long, and he gets the ball up in the air, and he allows his coverage units, his team, to get downfield to force fair catches. And then with Dustin, I know he's been down. He had a great game versus Denver when he made the field goals and the game-winning field goal. We'll see what his status is. And whoever they put out there as the kicker, we got to do a great job putting pressure on the kicker. It looks like uh, Carter's playing the slot and also doing the returning for them. Oh, yeah, he's a dual returner. Uh, plays, you know, punt return, kick return, shifty. He's been on multiple teams. He's done a, you know, great job multiple teams. I think I believe he's averaging almost a first down on punt return when it comes to, you know, each return that he has. So he's getting their offense a first down, which is great for their offense and with the weapons that they have on their offense. And he's expanded his role in offense, but he's dynamic with the ball in his hands. When he's, and he's, not, he's fearless when it comes to returning the, the ball. So he will f catch the ball in traffic. Our gunners and our punt interior, we have a great challenge this week versus him. So we're excited for the opportunity to come Sunday. If I can rewind a little bit, the conversation you had with Coach Smith after the DJ Moore penalty, you're trying to decide, do you want it on the kickoff, or do you want it on the extra point? Was it a close decision or was it pretty clear cut from your perspective, let's push the point, let's push the try back and, and take our chances that way? You know, we know when Coach Smith and our, myself, we have those discussions. My job as a coach, and this is what I signed up for, is to give them the information that I believe will be the best, you know, for that, that situation. And looking at it, you know, 12 seconds left in a timeout, if we do push them back on the kickoff and they don't kick in out the end zone for a touchback, time is – everything for us if we were trying to put ourselves in a position with a, if it's a one-point game so you know putting him back and knowing his history as a field goal kicker you know i just wanted to provide that information to coach smith and coach smith made a great decision with putting him back and being in a position where we could you know still play the game so when you talked to, to arthur you you knew at panera's numbers from whatever 48 you know yeah, th coach that's the information you're giving him there he's such and such from this distance yeah coach smith and myself we we both speak about that and that's something that we talk and that's the information we have throughout the week whether it's our scouting department coach king coach hoff and myself we we go over that information throughout the week and we provide that information to our players and also to our head coach so so when we get in those situations, we are prepared for that opportunity to make the proper decision when it comes to what we want to do with certain situations, when it comes to whether taking a penalty, whether it's on the PAT or if it's taking it on the kickoff. And that was a great opportunity for Coach Smith and myself to talk through the situation. And again, you know, I give a lot of props to our head coach. He did a great job with the decision making on Sunday. And it was a pretty clear cut decision from your perspective. You think that was, it, it wasn't like, and eh, we could go no, either way. I think time, time is the biggest variable when it comes to that. When it comes to time, if we have more time, then hey, let's take it because we could have better field position. But when you only have 12 seconds left and you are trying to get yourself in position to kick a field goal, that was the biggest variable. Let's say if there was like 50 seconds left, maybe you take it. Yes, yeah, different conversation. So I think that was the biggest variable for myself when talking to Coach Smith about that. How much time you have to make that decision but how much time do you have like I mean obviously the refs are wanting to move the game along but how long did you have to kind of discuss this? you know I, I, I wish somebody had like a stopwatch there for right. us or something <laughs> But again, it goes back to more prepared and more organized you are as an individual. To, you have a clear mind to talk about those things and come up with those decisions. So my job as a coach is to make Coach Smith's job as easy as possible when it comes to certain when making decisions and providing them with information. So that's it. Seemed like it was like I don't know, forever. You know, man. I was both. I don't know. It was like 15, 20 seconds. But those things you got to be on it when it comes to that, and that's what we get. You know, that's what we signed up for, and it was a great opportunity to be able to, you know, have that discussion with Coach Smith. And again, he did made a great decision when it came to that. Does a game like that illustrate the value of having a virtually automatic guy like Youngway in there?
there because you see their side misses some, your guy takes it dead red, and you come out with a victory. Does, does that kind of underline his, his value and the value of a player like that to an NFL team? It speaks volumes. Yeah, I mean, he's very valuable. It speaks volumes to you know our kicker, Koo. You know, young Wayne, when it comes to that, because of his mindset, his process, he's really process driven. He's not real big into the results because he knows the process will lead to results. So when it comes to like them trying to, you know, call Phil, go and freeze him, that doesn't bother us because we know what he's about. We know his mindset, his approach to the game, how process oriented he is. And he takes one rep at a time. So it's very valuable to have a kicker and a player like Koo. And then going back to our specialists too, our other specialists being able, in order for Koo to kick the ball, the ball has to be snapped. You know, with playing with your head between your legs and snapping the football, my bad. And then, you know, Bradley doing a great job holding. Whether we had to end the game kick where we were up six points and then the, at the end of the, the overtime having the, the, the three points to take the lead. Those things, those are hard jobs to do. If we want to go out there, like any of us go out there and go hold the ball while you got a kicker coming full speed to kick it, that's a very stressful position to be in, whether you're snapping or holding. So give credit to those guys and then the, the protection so Koo could just focus on doing his job. Bradley and Koo both mentioned post game that it was Liam's first situation in a game winning situation. Did that thought go through your head before the play at any point? I hope he, I hope he's okay with this. I hope he oh, doesn't. No. no? And I, if I, I remember you guys talking about last year, like somebody asked me if I was nervous when Koo kicked the game winning field goal. It was like he had three of them last year. No, because we're process driven. Whether we're kicking a PAT or the first field goal of the game or if we're kicking the game winner, the kick is a kick. And we pro our guys are prepared for those opportunities. We can have awareness about the situation, but we can't get fixated on the situation because at the end of the day, it's about the lost starts. You know, the basic fundamentals, pad level, blocking, tackling, snapping, catching, kicking. Those things all matter during that play. If you get fixated on the, oh, hey, I hope we win this game, I hope we make this kick, then you're not focused on the technique and the, the, the particular, you know, assignment at that, that given time. So to answer your question, no because we're prepared for those opportunities. We work those situations, and it's all about our basic fundamentals when it comes to that. And it's being brilliant with the basics right there. And uh, given that Josh is coming here, um, Harris, and you all uh, went to Bo, he got, actually got hurt. And then uh, how's Lamb doing as the long snapper this year? That's an you know, important position, you know. That, yeah, it's uh, a very valuable position, because you only have one on the roster, and there's only 32 in the NFL just like the kicker and punter. He's been doing a great job and he continues to get better with reps. Um, great job with a snap location, uh, snap velocity, protection. He's getting better each and every day and he's gaining that more and more confidence in the scheme and in the system. And it's great to have veterans like Koo and Bradley and even Bo being around in the building to help him with his development. So his best days are yet to come in his profession and we're excited for him. He's shooting it back pretty good. Oh, yeah. You want to go catch a couple after? No. Nah. No. Nah. All right. Put, put, put on a, some pads, right? Uh, it seemed like earlier in the game, Troy almost got to another punt. Obviously, he had the block in uh, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I think he's come close a couple more times. Can you just kind of talk about the threat he is in, the, in those situations? I mean, he has rare, you know, acceleration speed for his size, and he's doing a great job. We, we talk about in our room, great plays are made from great effort, and he, he shows that you know day in and day out with his effort. So he's getting close to a couple more. We're excited for him, what he's doing out there. But it, he's leading by example when it comes to playing with the effort that he's playing with. So he continues to get better when it comes to his basic fundamentals and his technique, and he's being disruptive when it comes to get into the punter, along with other guys like Richie Grant, you know, Felipe Franks, D'Angelo Malone. Those guys are really um, owning their responsibilities when it comes to punt return and rushing the punter. So hopefully, they, you know, they will continue to get better with their techniques and their fundamentals. And you're only guaranteed, like I said before, a kickoff and a kickoff return in the game. So we might have one opportunity on punt return. We might have 10 opportunities. We never know. So we got to take advantage of each and every one of those. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, second day in for us and um, another situational day. Uh, no different than it has been in the past weeks. The one thing, obviously, when you look at the Chargers uh, defensively, um, obviously familiar with the head coach, worked with them before. Um, schematically, obviously, he's got those guys, um, and he's had different guys in and out of the lineup, and he's got those guys playing, uh, especially um, they'll be ready coming off a bye for us, and we'll have a work cut out for us. 
when y'all decided, decided to sign Marcus, it was a second chance for him with Arthur. What made you think it was going to work as a second chance, and, and when did you start? And, and what points of data did you get along the way to make you think you made a good decision? Yeah, you know, I can't, I can't say exactly how Art went about the process, you know, in terms of chances and everything else. But for me, you know, when you go through the market, I had obviously never worked with Marcus before. Um, seen him play, been on the opposing sideline, seen him in cutups. Um, and you see a player, obviously, who's, you know, still in his 20s, um, who's got playing experience. Has done great things. College, got to the NFL, experienced some really good things. Went, you know, through a roller coaster of different things. So seasoned, and um, you know, when it comes to, you know, looking at the quarterback spot, I don't think it's one size fits all. And, and Marcus provided an opportunity for us um, offensively to uh, go in different directions and expand on different things um, that we thought best fit us. And so obviously when Marcus had a chance to come here and he signed here, uh, we got to work as an offensive staff to make sure um, whoever quarterback was going to be behind center, we were going to try to work to the best of their ability. Are there moments you see, not necessarily on Sundays even, but during the week where you, you see a guy, a veteran guy who has a second chance. This is not a rookie. This is a guy who's been here before and maybe has learned from X, Y, or Z in his past. Yeah, that's the great thing about being in this league a certain amount of time at the quarterback spot. Right. You have a chance to grow in different spots, even though when you're not playing. And so his time in Tennessee, and then he goes um, into the Raiders organization, and he gets a chance to sit back and look at another guy playing and then being coached by other people. And I think you take something from everybody at the quarterback spot, from your coaches, from the different players that you're either um, in the quarterback room with or in the locker room with. And you can tell, again, not privy to Marcus before this experience, um, but a guy – you know, I've been around a number of veteran quarterbacks. Um, he's along the same lines of he has an idea of what he knows he does well. He has an idea of what he needs to work on. And then you kind of worked in, in sync with each other to make sure that you try to accomplish those things on the physical and mental side. Since Cordero's been out, you've gotten a good look at uh, Tyler and Caleb and how they've been able to handle this running game. With Cordero coming back, whether that's this week or you know in the future, um, does that change your plans at all, just considering how well the, those other two backs have played in terms of being able to use all three of them um, in a you know committee of sorts, I guess? Yeah, I wouldn't say it changes anything. I think you've heard me up here before say if you have a helmet on Sunday, you know, we're going to try to find a way to use you to the best of your ability. It's no different if CP's back um, or not back. Uh, we're in a situation where it's our job as coaches to understand the roster that's going to be up. Um, it's obviously part of my job to make sure that we put those guys in the best position. And the way I see it is if he's up or he's not up, it's about getting everybody who has a chance to play, uh, putting them in the best position to be successful. Uh, this is not a scheme question. Oh, here we go. It's going to start <laughs> out like a well, scheme anybody question. Anybody who says that, the next question. But I, I would like part. to start with this disclaimer. It's yes. not a scheme question. Gilad, you, you choose if this is a scheme question. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll decide. How, how much precision do those screen passes, whatever they may be, take to really work well? I mean, what's the difference between one that works like Algiers, 25-yard sure. touchdown, and one that just gets blown up? Not a scheme. You don't think so? No. I think you guys are working together. Let me talk in a 10,000-foot view on the screens. No. Yeah, I mean, that there is, a, there is a somewhat of a thin line in terms of success and, and failure on the screens, right? You, there's some times where you have the back exactly where you want them, and the D-line doesn't cooperate with you, right? They read out of it. And again, sometimes it's just about where the game is going momentum-wise and how the defensive line's playing. Um, other times, right, the reality is you might have had a great call on and they were able to read out of it. Uh, I think more than anything else on screens, it's about the timing in which the offensive line and the running backs are in sync, as well as what you're getting defensively. And I think there's a combination of both. Um, there's some really good screen teams around the NFL, and there's some that, you know, for whatever reason, aren't as good. And the ones who are typically are good, you know, have a plan in place on how they want to do them. Um, they typically call it in certain situations. They're not necessarily predictable, but they are, they do stress the defense. Um, and so when you look at the certain screens, and we evaluate each year, every place I've been, you do a screen study, right? At the end of the season, you're like, hey, and you study other teams around the league. Um, but there is a synchronization that goes with having a screen be successful. Everybody from the, the back to the quarterback to the offensive line to the wideouts making it feel a certain way. 
So I think there's a little bit of an art to that um, in general. Uh, and again, obviously, you, you want to be successful on those, but um, they need to cooperate as well defensively. A bunch of reps just takes time. Is there yeah, any, is there any ma that, no yeah, magic sauce around. there? Right. It goes back to something that uh, guys have a, a true understanding of timing on screens. Every screen is a different time. So you've got wide receiver screens, halfback screens, and all those possess different timing for the offensive line and the quarterback, as well as when that receiver slash back who's receiving the ball knows when to get open. And the more obvious you are on those, right, the more the defense can sniff it out, especially at this level. And so you obviously want to make it look like something different. And I think for, for our standpoint, it's a constant daily when we're on the practice field working on not just that, but other fundamentals that involve that. It seems like your, your, your downfield blocking has been really good, whether it's in screens or just in <coughs> yards after the uh, catch. Um, how much of an asset has that been for you guys to maybe shorter passes in the more Yeah, it's a good question. I, it goes back to intent and style of play, I, I believe. Right. You can say, you know, I've been around one or two times here where you get around a certain offense and you preach and you preach and you preach about, you know, how you want to play. And then it's sometimes it's just words and then the actions don't necessarily follow. And then you get in situations where, you know, less is more with the words and you see the actions and you have a situation where you have a style of play in which you want to play football and everybody's bought in and they see the results and they see how it all works together. And I think when it comes to the downfield blocking situation, you know, receivers don't get enough credit at times for being complete players, not just everybody looks at the receptions and the targets. And I think that does an injustice to the position that there's a much more, specifically what we ask, there's much more than goes in just statistics for us. And the level in which these guys are competent to get the job done when the ball is not in their hands is being just as uh, highly evaluated as if when they have the ball in their hands. And again, it's more about the actions in which we ask and the intent in which they do. And I think hopefully that continues for the rest of the year. There was, there was a play late in that game against Carolina where Marcus was, you know, made a couple reads, got out of the pocket, and did something a little bit you know, off schedule. That was all coaching. To, all coaching. That. <laughs> well, that's good. That's what I was going to ask. How much of that is coaching? How much of that is yeah. just players kind of being in sync with one another and, and just making an instinctual play? Yeah, when I coached the position, when I was a quarterback coach, I was like, hey, the good plays was all coaching, the bad plays. The guy's uncoachable. Um, no, look, you know, you draft guys and you sign guys for certain reasons. Um, you're at the highest of the high at the NFL level, and they're obviously elite traits that guys have. Um, his ability, where I thought um, to be able to not just move around, right, but move around with a purpose. And I think you've seen that, right, game after game after game. Now guys are working with him. They're on the same page. Guys are getting a better feel for – you know, how we play and how Marcus plays. And, um, you know, hopefully, right, we're out there practicing, but hopefully that continues uh, for, the, for the remainder of the year. Can you just speak on uh, Demir Bird through the last two weeks and what he's been able to bring to the offense? Yeah, so, you know, Demir's a veteran. You know, he's been in different offenses. Uh, he has shared experiences in terms of, you know, playing and then having his work his way into a rotation and then take advantage of opportunities in which uh, when the ball presents itself or making a play down the field in which he's actually blocking uh, for others. And the one thing I'll say about Demir, just like a lot of our players, um, regardless of they're up, down, in the rotation, out of the rotation, you don't see a change in their attitude on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at the practice. And it's an attribute to the professionalism uh, that guys possess, not just Demir, but others. And you love when guys put in the work, they get an opportunity, and they take advantage of it. And, and Demir, just like other players, um, when their number has been called, uh, they've, had, they've shown the ability to do that. Hopefully that continues. What uh, problems uh, or challenges that the um, edge rushers present for y'all, Kyle Van Noy and uh, – Who's the other guy? The other guy, yeah. Some I don't, know, I don't know the other guy. Some other guy from yeah. Buffalo or yeah. something, yeah. I'm not familiar, little, with, I'm not familiar with that guy's number. I think it's 51. Um, yeah, I'll make sure I say hello, exchange Christmas cards uh, before the game, tell how much I appreciate our time together. Uh, look, you know, great players on defense. We can talk about Khalil. I, again, similar to the Aaron Donalds of the world, like what else can I add that hasn't been said about him? Uh, when you talk about the rest of the defense, though, here's what I will say. You've got a defense that 
uh, does a great job pre-snap of, of applying pressure to the quarterback and the offensive line by giving different structures and different looks. By doing that, right, they make the offense kind of what the offense tries to do to a defense, right? We try to give you motions and different things pre-snap to get you to think. And I think this is what Brandon does a really good job of. He's obviously, um, he's been under the tutelage of some very good coaches. Um, he's taken that and he's, now he's done his own thing with it. So uh, our work's cut out for us. You've got a secondary that reacts and sees the ball well. You've got linebackers who come downhill and they're going to add the physicality. And you've got a front that knows how to mix up the different structures. And um, I've worked with uh, a few of those guys. Uh, I know what they teach and I've got the utmost respect for those guys. Um, uh, I'm not sure I, I can answer your question. It's just what you got to do is find out, okay, where he came from, what they did while he was there, what similarities does that have with what we have so that can we use him in those ways because he already kind of knows it rather than because you may have the exact same coverage, but it's called something different. Uh, one cover three could be called cover three. Another one could be called solid. Another one could be called Trace. It's, and they're all cover threes. But he may have come from a system. I know Spags at Kansas City because Spags coached for me at Baltimore, was my secondary coach. So there's some similarities in some things. But, you know, and it's also nice to know somebody like that that you can talk to and ask him about him and say what is his best attributes, what's, what's he do well, what's he have to work on. And so, you know, don't go out there and try to teach him a – something that he hasn't played in the course of the last couple of years. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit of both. It's getting him familiar with what we call things and then us familiar with what he can do. So don't try to put him in a tough spot. Don't ask him to try to do things he can't, can't do right now. Doesn't mean he can't do them, but right now it might be difficult. You can't crash course the whole what we've just done in, you know, 15 weeks in two days. So it's just the other thing is you don't want to overload them. And then if you overload them, then they're sitting out there thinking, what am I supposed to be doing while the guy is running by him? So basically secondary. What, what does Justin Herbert do so well? And, and how challenging is this passing attack for you guys? Well, he's, a, he's accurate as heck. Um, he's big. He's strong. He's hard to bring down. He doesn't get sacked very often. He doesn't take very many sacks. He's mobile. Um, I mean, he's not necessarily a guy that's just really looking to run. He's not doing that. He wants to throw it. He wants to be a pocket passer, but he will run, and he can, can uh, get away from you. Um, you know, like I say, he doesn't take very many sacks. I mean, he hangs in there, and I've seen him throw some completions while guys are draped all over him. So he's, he's very accurate. I think he's very smart. I think they got a great system that he fits in very, very well. I think I give them credit, too. They, they do things – to help all quarterbacks, I, but he, he's an exceptional, exceptional talent. He's one of those new young quarterbacks like Allen and him and that are coming along that are just they're, – they're the Nate, next Peyton Mannings and Brady's and those guys. They are. I mean, they're, they're good, they're real good. We talk a lot about arm strength. Um, does it make a real practical difference in the back end when you're facing a guy who maybe can zip it a little bit faster or a lot faster than the average guy? Do it's more about it? the release than it is about the velocity of the ball. No, because like when you watch Aaron Rodgers, what makes Aaron Rodgers special is he's like this and the ball's gone. You know, then there's other guys that come back and they wind up. Well, if I wind up and I'm really good in reading that, I get a better break on the ball. It's when that ball just gets flicked and, and there's something on it. You know, it's not just I'm flicking it out there and it's kind of floating. You know, the guy, that, that makes the difference. It's more to me about the, the delivery and the quickness of the delivery than it is about the actual arm strength. All the quarterbacks are, have strong arms. I mean, you, you go back there and you, got, you watch guys in pregame and you're watching that guy going, man, that guy throws a, whew, that's a pretty ball. You know, it's tight spiral, it's in there. But it's more about the ability, if you're playing zone, man doesn't really matter, you're on the guy. But it has more to do with the delivery and how fast the guy's release is. Aaron Rodgers is exceptional. Um, I heard Josh Allen say the other night, um, he, they were interviewing him or something, and he had stolen something from 
Rodgers a little bit on uh, how to deliver a ball that way while facing this way. And so, but it's, and that all of a sudden that that's that's you know normally you're sitting there as a defensive back and the guy's looking this way and you're starting to lean that way and then all of a sudden that ball is out the other way. So if, if the guy has to turn to throw it and do it, well, hopefully you can turn into it. But if all of a sudden the guy can just flick it and still get there just as fast, that to me is the biggest difference in quarterbacks. Seems like you've had Jalen Hawkins this back this week. Can you just talk about what you've seen from him, uh, his development, especially over the course of this year, and just generally what he means to your defense? Well, I think he's. You know, we always thought he was a physical player. Um, he really studies. He's really, really trying to be a complete safety and knowing everything, knowing, the, you know, communication, the whole thing. And I think he's really grown in that way a lot. Um, you know, before I thought he was more like, I know what to do, but I'd really rather have somebody else tell me a little bit and t kind of take charge. I don't think that's true anymore. I think he's just as much to take charge as Richie is or Eric or whoever else is back there. So uh, I think he's really progressed that way in just knowing the defense, knowing what we want and communicating it. Dean gone, you've got to find some more depth at, at safety. Do you look for that, you know, with the guys, with practice squad guys or with guys that maybe you've cross-trained Both. versus? Both, yeah. There's guys in there that have played uh, nickel and safety that we've cross-trained a little bit. You always do that just in case of emergency because, you you know, if all of a sudden in a game you lose two guys, you can't pull somebody off the practice squad during the game. Somebody's got to kind of know how to go in and do that. So in our case, we've got some guys that have cross-trained there that could, could be in that role. Or, and we've also taken some guys this week and we're working with them, the practice squad guys that could get elevated. They might not. I, you know, I never know. We just we got a plan for everything. Art's the one that has to make a decision at the end of the week of who the guys are that are going to be active. And you know, it may be a situation on offense. They need an extra dude, and, and you can't have that guy. Maybe you can't have him. I don't know. And then special teams is involved. So that's. That's always the, that's our decision at the end of the week. We just try to get them ready and, hey, who he says we have, we have. They've got two uh, rookies starting on the offensive line. Um, they've got their couple starters that are usually there if they're out. Um, what does that mean for the defense getting, as far as getting pressure? Just got to beat them. It's just, to me, the guys, what game are we in? Ninth? They ain't rookies anymore. I mean, at what point in time you quit being a rookie? You know, so to me, it's like we got we got AK and we got uh, D'Angelo. What are they? No, well, I don't think of them as rookies anymore. It's your ninth game. You're not a rookie anymore. So to me, they've they've seen a lot of defense here in in preseason. They've seen a lot of defense here in nine games or whatever it is. That rookie stuff is so to me overrated. If they if they weren't real good, they wouldn't be there. That's the way I put it. You know, everybody talks about this guy, that guy, this backup. If you're an NFL football player, you're pretty good, period. If you're one of the 53 on any 32 teams, you're a pretty good football player. That's the way I look at everybody. Uh, yeah, Coach, how do they blend the, the receivers with the running back, uh, Eckler and Allen? Allen's <coughs> back, I guess. Williams and Carter well, started their last game. Looks like Eckler's getting a lot of touches. He's a good player. Okay, to me, it's it's similar, you know, to Kamara. You got a good football player. The guy's a good good running back, and the guy's also a good receiver out of the backfield getting the ball. You know, it's kind of like when we back in New England, we had Kevin Falk, get him the ball. You know, get him the ball in space and see what he can do. I mean, he's a. Uh, I don't think it's any rocket science. You got a good football player. Why would you pigeonhole him and just say he's a running back? This guy can do a lot of things well, so we're gonna, they're going to get him the ball. And along with the receivers, and the quarterback's good at, at you know, it's, it's, it's always tough, too, trying to take care of a running back while you're trying to take care of receivers out there. So sometimes that's uh, – they can get, get a pretty good matchup on a linebacker or whoever it might be. So, I mean, the guy, the guy is really a good football player, has been. Are there any coaching points that you give it to players at this level when you are facing a guy like Austin Eckler, who's a smaller, chippier, hard to, but still very elusive back versus a bigger, more physical, power, powerful back, just in terms of the approach and trying to take them down? Uh, try to get them some help. <laughs> try, try to not get too many one-on-ones if you can help it. Uh, you know, just the biggest thing is try to take the air out of it. 
a little bit sometimes because what happens is if you try to play, you know, everybody thinks, well, I, d I don't want to get up too quick you know, on him because he's quick. Well, that's kind of not necessarily always a good approach because if I'm playing off of him at five or six yards, I'm probably not going to get him on the ground either. He's still going to become quick at the closer I get to him. So if I can somehow take a little something off of him, get my hands on him, those kinds of things, uh, it's just like a receiver. I mean, if you got a really quick receiver on the line that can really get off the line, if you don't get your hands on them, then you got no you got no chance. If you try to play off of them, they're gonna they're gonna out quick you. If they're quicker than you, they're quicker than you. So how can I negate that? Well, I can get my hands on them and try to stop the quickness before it gets started. So, you know, that's easier said than done with a running back because you you know you also still, still got to play the run. I mean, you can't just we can't have somebody sitting up there playing him in the pass all day and then they run the ball on you and then you know linebackers are usually off at four yards depth or something like that it's hard to get them up there on them so you just you just you got to keep it mixed and, and and not do the same thing all the time